動物、動物、おるおるおるおるおるおる The anime begins with a butler named Sebastian who makes all the girls in real life only like 2D guys, presenting breakfast and tea to his master seal, while also notifying him of upcoming appointments with Mr. Hughes, a Roman Empire history expert, and Mr. Damiano from the Poseidon Company. Alongside these distinguished guests, a man named Baldo, engaged in stuffed animal production in India, is also scheduled to visit. Attended by the butler, the master readies himself for the day, displaying remarkable skill by effortlessly intercepting a thrown dart as he departs. Amidst the mansion's grandeur, the master enjoys breakfast in the company of his maids. The butler enters, reassigning tasks and admonishing the maids for their diligence. The master then ascends to the mansion's upper floor, gazing upon a portrait of his departed parents. The dining table is immaculately set with gleaming silver cutlery and a pristine, wrinkle-free tablecloth. The master's favorite white roses have been meticulously tended to, and an array of carefully selected ingredients lays the foundation for an exquisite dinner. This lavish hospitality exemplifies the standards of the Phantom Hive household. Bells labeled with different titles beckon in the study, guiding the master through the corridor. His summons draw the attention of the other maids, who seize this opportunity to prove their worth and outshine their peers in the eyes of their master. Desiring a sweet treat, the master's request is countered by the handsome-looking Sebastian, unlike yourself, his butler, who advises against it due to the impending dinner with guests. However, the master remains resolute, demanding a parfait and commanding Sebastian to remove a portrait from the hall, symbolizing his authority as the head of the Phantom Hive family. Sebastian, with an air of authority, points out flaws in the preparations, a barren harvest, broken cutlery, and charred stoves, mocking the other maids. A sense of urgency envelops them as they have a mere two hours before the guests' arrival. Sebastian channels the disciplined approach of Tanaka, another household member, and instructs the maids to act swiftly and efficiently. The guests arrive by buggy, greeted by Sebastian. The stone garden, a Japanese tradition, captivates the visitors, who are then led to the manor to await dinner. Engaging in a game of Monopoly, the master and the guests discuss East India's business landscape and exceptional staff. The master's mention of being entranced by the eyes of the deceased intrigues the guests. Amid their conversation, the master interrupts, urging the guest to make his move and disclose his reason for seeking support, a request for an additional 12,000 pounds. The guest outlines a potentially lucrative venture aiming to elevate the Funtum Company's presence in South Asia, but is halted by the master's cryptic comment. As the dinner preparations conclude, the guests are invited to the dining table. Sliced raw beef, known as donberry, is presented as an ancient Japanese dish. Sebastian's presentation is flawlessly theatrical and exudes confidence. A mishap involving spilled wine is swiftly rectified by Sebastian, leaving the guest awestruck by the impeccable hospitality. The master encourages the guests to resume their game, but the guest, citing another commitment, exits after cryptically mentioning a contract. Using the telephone, the guest communicates with someone, expressing disinterest in a factory's welfare and intentions to pocket the proceeds. A feeling of being observed unsettles him, culminating in a fleeting encounter with a phantom face rising from a portrait. Dismissing it as a trick of the mind, they resume their game. Lost within the mansion's labyrinthine corridors, the guest encounters the phantom face once more, which precipitates a fall down the stairs, severely injuring his leg. In his desperation, he encounters Sebastian, who encourages him to savor the experience. Terrified, the guest retreats to a dim room, mistaking an oven for a cupboard. Sebastian enters, remarking that the oven has been started, and a sequence of events unfolds eerily mirroring their Monopoly game, surveillance, injury, stumbling steps, and ultimately being consumed by flames. Sebastian delivers lemon pie to the maids, endearing himself to them. He also orders Baldo to replace the kitchen oven, and Seal, the master, hears the guests' screams, echoing his perception of the guests' greed as akin to that of a pig's. Seal comprehends that Damiano betrayed his factory workers and aimed to keep the profit for himself. In a different thread of this enigmatic tale, Baldo and his companions are engaged in the challenging task of rat catching. Meanwhile, nobles like Seal are indulging in a game of snooker pool. One inquisitive noble queries Seal about the eradication of vermin, to which Seal nonchalantly responds, asserting his authority to do so at his leisure. He playfully references the forbidden cheese with its nibbles from the rats. The control over the storehouse key lies in Seal's hands, yet it requires considerable effort to locate the rat's nest and eliminate the rodents. The noble proposes that a suitable reward be prepared for this undertaking. Sir Arthur mockingly labels Seal a vulture, to which Seal retorts by highlighting his family crest's dignity. Seal rises from his seat, declaring an end to the feudal game. 
Arthur promises that the rewards will be ready by nightfall, and Seal offers to send carriages. He then astounds the onlookers by sinking two balls with a single shot. Madame Red admires Sebastian's skills and even indulges in a rather inappropriate gesture towards him. Seal subtly signals her to cease her actions, leading her to apologize for her actions. As they convene for tea in the guest room, it's revealed that Madame Red is Seal's aunt. Seal excuses himself from the room, leaving behind a group of maids grappling with a rat-catching challenge. Sebastian updates Seal on the menu and inquires about dining with the guests. Seal instructs Sebastian to bring his lunch to his room, expressing his reluctance to deal with the matters at hand. As Seal enters his room, he is suddenly ambushed, a cloth placed over his mouth to incapacitate him. A concerned Sebastian knocks on Seal's door but receives no response. Upon entering, he discovers the room in disarray, lamenting the potential waste of tea. In an alternate narrative in Old London, the hierarchy of England's underworld is personified by an infamous noble. Known as the Queen's Guard Dog, he embodies absolute power, swiftly quelling those who oppose the monarchy. Seal finds himself chained and bloodied, facing this villainous figure, Azuro Venal of the Pharaoh family. The Italian Mafia's struggles in England are evident, and Azuro berates Englishmen for their perceived weakness for the Queen. Seal and Azuro engage in a conversation, touching upon drug trade and royal mandates. Azuro's intention is to halt the vermin and drug operations at Seal's behave. However, their dialogue takes an aggressive turn, with Azuro pointing a gun at Seal, demanding the key to the storehouse. When Seal produces the key, he is shot multiple times by Azuro, who then orders his henchmen to kill Seal's servants. Azuro's men reveal their master's name and hide out to Sebastian before meeting their fate as the vehicle thereon plunges off a cliff. <laughs> Back at the mansion, Azuro tightens security and guards the entrance. In a swift and brutal sequence, Sebastian infiltrates the guards, slaying them with cutlery and steel plates. Azuro's confidence crumbles as he faces Sebastian, but he takes Seal hostage, demanding the goods. As Sebastian retrieves the key and presents it, Azuro shoots him, only to find Sebastian unaffected. Sebastian's resilience stuns Azuro and leaves him defenseless, enabling Seal to mock his downfall. Azuro is eventually defeated by Sebastian, whose otherworldly abilities and loyalty to Seal are unveiled. <laughs> Azuro's men inadvertently disclose vital information about their master before Sebastian terminates them. As Sebastian exits the mansion, Seal's home is reduced to ashes, marking the climax of a tale entangled in secrets, power struggles, and the enigmatic connection between master and butler. Amidst the whirlwind of events, the butler, Madame Red's trusted servant, Slam, unwittingly stumbles into a chaotic scenario. His delivery of hot tea takes a disastrous turn as he accidentally spills it on one of the maids. A mishap follows when he inadvertently shatters cutlery and disturbs the tablecloth, sending Seal's meal askew and turning the room into a mess. Balad voices his frustration, questioning Seal's choice of hiring such an inept individual. Seal attributes his decision to a miscalculation, revealing Madame Red's request to groom Slam as a version of Sebastian. In return for this favor, she promises rewards. Seal's assumption was that only Sebastian would be inconvenienced, thereby avoiding any actual harm. The other maids express their anger and disdain toward Grell, who initiated the chaos, even resorting to pointing a knife at him in a bid to shame him. Sebastian intervenes, suggesting that Grell needn't die, as his blood would make cleaning the room even more challenging. Grell perceives Sebastian's unusual kindness, and despite the tense atmosphere, acknowledges it. Nonetheless, Sebastian remains incredulous about the notion of Grell serving the young master. Sebastian takes on the task of rectifying the situation. He guides Grell in brewing the perfect tea, correcting the fragrance Les Brew Glam had prepared earlier. All the maids observe Sebastian's actions intently, absorbing the lesson. Sebastian then informs Seal that a carriage awaits him outside. Advising Grell not to stir up further trouble, Sebastian departs. In another part of London, a bustling street is filled with people engaged in their daily routines. A man reads news about a mysterious murder of a prostitute. Seal and Sebastian enter a shop to acquire walking sticks for Seal. One of the sticks is a magnification tool, perfectly straight. After purchasing the walking sticks, Sebastian and Seal discuss the recent disturbances caused by Grell and others. The Funtum Toy Manufacturing Company has witnessed remarkable growth in the past three years, which is reflected in the magnificence of the rebuilt mansion. Meanwhile, Grell and other maids converse about the mansion's history. The real Tanaka reveals to Grell that the previous Phantom Hive generation died in a fire three years ago, leading to the mansion's reconstruction. Grell learns that Seal's parents perished in the blaze. In an eccentric gesture, Grell shapes the bushes into skull formations, baffling the others. Upon their return to the mansion, Seal and Sebastian are greeted by a surprising and extravagant transformation. 
The mansion is adorned in girly decorations, and all the maids attribute the creation to a certain girl in a specific room. Seal enters the room to find Lady Elizabeth running toward him, embracing him in a warm hug. He gazes at the mansion with a mixture of disappointment and disbelief. Sebastian greets Lady Elizabeth as she continues her whirlwind of activities, dressing everyone like babies. Seal questions Elizabeth about her presence and her mother's whereabouts. Elizabeth admits to sneaking out to see Seal. Grell inquires about Elizabeth's identity, and Sebastian identifies her as Lady Elizabeth Ethel Cordelia Midford, Seal's betrothed. Elizabeth insists on having a ball that evening and has already selected attire for Seal. Sebastian advises Seal to comply with her wishes temporarily, and then ask her to leave. Seal instructs Sebastian to provide Elizabeth with dinner and escort her out. Seal emphasizes his busy schedule, expressing his reluctance to waste time on frivolous matters. Sebastian offers Seal a fruit cake as a solution. Seal eventually concedes to Elizabeth's demand for a ball, a move aimed at keeping her happy. He agrees to dance as well, as Sebastian suggests that a first-class gentleman is expected to possess dancing skills. Despite his initial reluctance, Seal agrees to be taught by Sebastian. Sebastian assumes the role of Seal's dance instructor, imparting the art to him. He advises Seal to adjust his facial expressions accordingly. Seal shares his difficulty in smiling and having fun naturally. As Seal descends the staircase, he encounters Elizabeth, prompting a change in his expression. Elizabeth notices a ring in Seal's hand and questions its absence from her collection. She takes the ring from him and unintentionally breaks it while tossing it aside. This act of destruction infuriates Seal, and he is on the verge of striking Elizabeth before Sebastian intervenes. <laughs> Sebastian explains the significance of the ring, stating it's an heirloom of the Phantom Hive family, passed down through generations. Seal's anger subsides, and he takes a softer approach, suggesting they dance together. As Sebastian plays the violin in the background, Grell joins in, singing along. Seal and Elizabeth take to the dance floor, their graceful moves continuing until Elizabeth is exhausted. Eventually, Elizabeth is sent home in a carriage. Late at night, Sebastian returns the repaired ring to Seal, having mended it to perfection. He tells Seal that a phantom hive butler incapable of such feats isn't worthy of his position. Seal then requests that Sebastian stay with him until he falls asleep. Having relocated to their secondary residence, Sebastian and Seal enter a room already occupied by Madame Red and Lau, who inform Seal that his presence here indicates a significant event, the Queen's guard dog is taking action. Seal discusses a recent perplexing murder of a prostitute in White Capel. The gruesome details of the murder are disturbingly bizarre. The victim, Mary Ann Nichols, was gruesomely dismembered, and the press dubs the killer Jack the Ripper. Lau playfully teases Seal's aversion to facing such macabre circumstances, describing the scene's dark aura and its capacity to consume those who engage with it. Lau questions if Seal is prepared for the ensuing madness. Seal dismisses Lau's query, stating that he came to allay Madame Red's worries and won't be deterred by such a question. Intriguingly, Seal arrives at the murder scene, where a constable mistakes him for a child and urges him to leave. Sir Arthur Randall arrives and questions Seal's presence. Seal claims to be cleaning up after the sluggish authorities working on the case. He presents Arthur with a letter, asserting that Scotland Yard could benefit from his insights. Arthur dismisses Seal, insisting that they don't need his assistance. Later, Seal and Sebastian visit an undertaker's establishment run by an acquaintance of Seal. The undertaker reveals that the victim's wombs are missing from their bodies. The gruesome nature of the murders involves both brutal slashing and precise organ removal, hinting at a ritualistic aspect. Sebastian and the undertaker discuss the intricate nature of the mutilations. <laughs> Seal and Sebastian present their hypothesis, they believe the murder involves ritualistic practices and secret societies or black magic. Sebastian volunteers to compile a list of suspects and question them. As they return home, they are surprised to find Sebastian awaiting their arrival. Sebastian has already finished the list, contacted suspects, and gathered statements. This astounds Madame Red and Lau. Their investigation leads them to one primary suspect, Alistair Chambers, Viscount Drute. He graduated from medical school but never practiced, instead hosting parties that seem to have an exclusive and secretive nature. To infiltrate Drute's last party of the season, Seal disguises himself as a prostitute while Sebastian plays the role of his tutor. Madame Red cautions Seal to maintain his facade and not reveal his true identity as a phantom hive. The partygoers discuss Drute, known for his libertine tendencies and rumored involvement in black magic. As they engage with the guests, Seal's panic spikes when he hears Elizabeth's voice. Sebastian advises Seal to remain calm and hide, diverting Elizabeth's attention. 
The ladies chat about Droot's reputation while Droot himself takes an interest in Seal. He flirts with Seal, who finds the encounter repulsive. Droot leads Seal away, and the scene transitions to Seal waking up confined in a cage. He realizes he's being auctioned, with people bidding to possess or use him as they please. In a desperate plea, Seal calls out to Sebastian using his magical eye. The room plunges into darkness, and when light is restored, everyone has fallen unconscious. Sebastian has arrived, unties Seal, and frees him from the cage. Sebastian suggests that this incident resolves the case of Jack the Ripper. Sebastian. The two decide to leave before Scotland Yard arrives. The following day's newspaper headlines reveal another murder attributed to Jack the Ripper, implying that Droot wasn't the actual perpetrator. Seal is left in disbelief and confusion as the case takes an unexpected turn. The headlines declare that Jack the Ripper has struck again. In a heartfelt conversation, Madame Red speaks to Seal about the challenges he faces as the Queen's Guard dog. She reflects on how his mother, her sister, would never have wanted him to be associated with the underworld. Seal shares that his purpose isn't solely to avenge his parents, he aims to inflict the same suffering upon those who betrayed and defiled his family. Despite her inability to bear children, Madame Red considers Seal as her own. After she leaves, she entrusts Sebastian with Seal's safety. Sebastian enters Seal's room, discussing the ongoing case of Jack the Ripper. They ponder whether the Viscount they suspected is truly the culprit. In a clandestine location, they stake out and observe someone. Suddenly, a loud scream pierces the air, prompting them to rush toward the source. Opening the door, they find a prostitute's bloodied body on the ground. As they step back, Grell emerges from the room, drenched in blood. Grell abandons his pretense and reveals his true appearance, sporting red hair, sharp teeth, and glasses. He introduces himself as Grell Sutcliffe, the butler of the Grim Reapers. It's the first time Seal sees a demon acting as a butler. Sebastian questions why a divine entity like Grell has chosen to be a butler. Grell hints at falling in love with certain women. Madame Red also exits the room, and it becomes apparent that Seal had suspected her and Grell for some time. Grell lunges at Seal and Sebastian with a chainsaw, but Sebastian expertly parries the attack. Seal is intrigued by the unusual weapon and asks Sebastian about it. Sebastian explains that it's the scythe of a grim reaper and Grell refers to it as his death scythe. Grell reveals his affinity for the color red, likening his gruesome work to painting the ugly women with beautiful red blood. Seal removes his eye patch and commands Sebastian to end both of their opponents. Yes, my lord. Grell fiercely assaults Sebastian with his chainsaw, relentlessly pushing him back. Sebastian employs his agility to evade the attacks, their clash intensifying. In the midst of the battle, Madame Red targets Seal and wounds his forearm. He demands to know why she did it, and she angrily retorts that he should never have been born, attacking him with a dagger. Sebastian prepares to kill Madame Red, but Seal intervenes, preventing him from doing so. Madame Red's memories flood back as she sees her sister and Seal, and her resolve wavers. Grell exploits the moment, impaling her heart with his chainsaw, expressing his disappointment. As Madame Red falls, her life flashes before her eyes, a cinematic record of her deeds and misdeeds. She recalls how she lost her husband and was unable to bear a child. Fueled by anger at prostitutes who aborted their babies without remorse, she killed each one that came to her for abortion. As her coat is removed and she prepares to leave, Seal commands Sebastian to kill Grell. Grell questions whether Seal isn't afraid of death. Seal calmly responds that as long as he holds the contract, Sebastian is his loyal servant, bound to obey his every order. Seal gently drapes his coat over Madame Red's lifeless body, paying his respects to the fallen. The battle between the demon and the Grim Reaper erupts, escalating on the rooftop of a nearby house. Grell launches relentless attacks at Sebastian, who skillfully evades each strike. Their clash is illuminated by the moonlight. Despite Grell's flirtatious behavior, Sebastian is repulsed by his antics. Grell advances, headbutting Sebastian and slashing his chest with the chainsaw. Blood flows from the wound, triggering Sebastian's cinematic memories to unfold. Amidst the chaos, Sebastian's concern for his clothes surprises Grell. Sebastian contemplates using a technique he had hoped to avoid, but circumstances compel him to employ it. With a serious demeanor, Sebastian confronts Grell, and they square off under the moon's glow. Thinking quickly, Sebastian tosses his tailcoat onto the chainsaw, immobilizing it. He explains that the tailcoat, made of high-quality Yorkshire wool, possesses remarkable frictional force, making it difficult to remove once ensnared. 
Although he laments damaging the coat, Sebastian gains the upper hand as Grell struggles to free the chainsaw. Engaging in a fist fight, Sebastian gains confidence, delivering a flurry of kicks and punches. As he approaches Grell, he considers the Grim Reaper's scythe and its cutting power. Picking up the chainsaw, Sebastian questions Seal's readiness to bear the weight of killing a divine being. Seal firmly asserts his order. However, their confrontation is disrupted by William T. Spears, an administrator from the Grim Reaper's Staffing Association. William intervenes, apologizing for Grell's actions and explaining that he violated the Reaper's code. William swiftly apprehends Grell and departs, leaving Sebastian and Seal behind. <laughs> They return to their mansion in London. At Madame Red's funeral, Sebastian places a red dress over her casket, a gesture of remembrance. Meanwhile, Scotland Yard continues its investigation into the recent incidents. Seal refrains from revealing the identity of Jack the Ripper to authorities, in line with the Queen's wishes to conclude the matter. The objective has been achieved. Seal advises Lau to leave London and the opium den behind. Lau jokes about his attachment to the country. Seal visits the grave of the last victim of Jack the Ripper, laying flowers as he reflects on the events of the previous night. Seal, Sebastian, and their maids head towards Queen's Health Resort, arriving at the entrance of the village. They notice colorful fabrics hanging from a barren tree and animal skulls scattered on the ground, ominous signs that hint at the village's planned transformation into the resort. Seal explains the history of bear baiting and its transformation into dog fighting using attack dogs instead of bears. Houndsworth, a village known Known for this practice is their destination, to be secured under the guise of a health resort construction site. Sebastian inquires about the need for them to personally oversee this project. Seal reveals that there's a deeper reason, something the Phantom Hive family must handle in person. They encounter an elderly woman who labels Seal's black appearance as an omen of bad luck. This eerie introduction sets the tone for their visit. <laughs> Upon reaching the village, they are met by a maiden who escorts them to her master. Unbeknownst to Seal, her master beats her with a whip, mistaking him for someone else. The master, still skeptical of Seal's role, can't believe such a tiny poodle could be the queen's messenger. Seal's purpose is to negotiate the purchase of Houndsworth, but the master is adamant about not selling due to a perceived curse. The villagers missing or dying under mysterious circumstances is part of the curse's effects. Seal finds this intriguing and decides to witness this calamity himself. Angela, the maiden, engages with other maids, discussing the village's mysterious events. At night, Angela implores Seal to leave, and they hear eerie howling that terrifies her. Demon hounds are approaching. She claims that anyone defying the village is cursed by these supernatural hounds, a law the villagers adhere to strictly. The next day, they visit the beach, with Seal's maids enjoying the water while he reads. Seal orders Sebastian to intervene, leading to an altercation with the villagers. Finney intervenes when dogs are being attacked, and Seal and the others are soon chained up. Angela begs for their forgiveness, but Henry, the master of the village, demands their departure. Seal refuses to bow down to his obsession with power and decides to protect his tiny kingdom. As Henry releases dogs to attack, Sebastian arrives, swiftly fending them off. He displays his devil's eyes, frightening the dogs into submission, shocking the villagers. Seal exposes Henry's manipulations, revealing that he projected the illusion of a demon hound to maintain control. He demonstrates that Henry's true intent was to consolidate power, deceiving the villagers for years. Sebastian provides evidence, a skull that matches the teeth marks found on the body of one victim, and a piece of cloth bitten off Henry's leg by one of the dogs. Henry's deception is laid bare, and the villagers turn against him. As they prepare to leave, a scream is heard, May Rin has discovered blood in Henry's cell. His lifeless body is found in the same spot where the villagers executed their punishments, bringing an unexpected end to his reign of manipulation and terror. Sebastian and CL stood before Henry's cell, surrounded by a macabre scene of bloodstains. Suddenly, a frantic villager approached them, trembling, and delivered the grim news that the dreaded demon hound had exacted its punishment on Henry and other villagers who were caught in its vengeful ire. The villagers, filled with fear, chanted a song condemning the disobedient black dog. Rushing to the location, Sebastian examined Henry's lifeless body, noting his maimed left hand, violently torn away. Seal revealed that this village had been isolated due to the terror of the demon hound's curse, which Seal suspected was fabricated by Lord Henry to solidify his rule. But now, with Henry dead, the truth was enigmatic. Sebastian voiced the notion that this gruesome act wasn't committed by a human. At bedtime, Seal questioned Sebastian's cryptic remark, leading to Sebastian's revelation that the Hound was targeting Lord Henry himself, as he was the primary subject of its pursuit. He speculated that no one else would have been a target. During the night, Finney and May Rin heard strange noises emanating from Angela's room. 
prompting them to investigate her safety. To their astonishment, they stumbled upon a disconcerting sight. A naked man was licking Angela's neck. Shocked, Finney fled while May Rin relayed the situation. Angela was nowhere to be found. Bald informed them that he had gone in search of herbs. Alarmed, they embarked on a quest to locate her. Their search led them to a graveyard, where they heard the mournful cry of a werewolf. Concealing themselves, they observed a naked man approaching the graveyard. A noise alerted the man, but he vanished as the villagers appeared unexpectedly. After their departure, the man transformed into the demon hound. As it lunged toward Finney, Sebastian intervened, using a strategy of rewards and punishments. He offered dog biscuits, alternately petting and kicking the hound, until it was subdued. Sebastian forcefully hurled the hound into the ground, causing a spring to burst forth. Emerging from the spring, the hound had transformed back into a human. Angela arrived and revealed the man's name as Pluto. She had found him a month earlier and kept him due to his endearing qualities. His tendency to transform into a human when excited had been kept secret. Angela confessed that Lord Barrymore had manipulated the demon hound legend to conceal his own fear of it. She never anticipated that Pluto would harm him. She requested if they could keep Pluto, and despite Sebastian's reluctance, Seal agreed, teasing Sebastian. <laughs> Grateful villagers attributed the end of the demon hound curse to Sebastian and his group. Angela explained that the land would weep tears of forgiveness once the sins against dogs from the past were atoned for. The villagers misinterpreted this as the creation of a hot spring, which led to the establishment of a resort. The once gloomy village transformed, and Queen Victoria's concerns were alleviated. The case concluded, Sebastian and company departed for the city, bidding farewell to Pluto and Angela. Gathered before Seal were his loyal associates, his butler Sebastian, the phantom image known as Pluto, his assistants May Rin and Finney, and the sturdy bald. In a moment of anticipation, May Rin inquired about the purpose of their meeting. Seal revealed his intention to assign them a task. The group's initial concern turned into relief as they realized Seal wasn't planning to dismiss them. He unveiled an intriguing artifact, a camera reportedly from the renowned collection of William Henry Fox Talbot. The camera held a mysterious ability to capture individuals alongside the beings they cherished most fondly in memory. Suddenly, the real Tanaka emerged, enlightening them about William Henry Fox Talbot's historical significance. A rumor surrounded Talbot's final camera, suggesting that the person most dearly remembered would appear alongside the subject in the photograph. Seal tested the camera, capturing an image of Finney, revealing a bird, Finney's cherished companion, in the picture. The photograph seemed to conjure memories of departed loved ones, implying the appearance of those who had passed away. Seal's directive was clear, covertly photograph Sebastian using this peculiar camera, unbeknownst to him. They aimed for a candid shot to unveil Sebastian's hidden affections. The challenge emerged as Sebastian, lightning fast, recited in the library. The camera's 10-second capture time clashed with his swiftness. Repeated attempts to photograph him yielded failure. Unbeknownst to them, Sebastian approached, obliging them to conceal Pluto. The blurred photographs they managed to snap drew Sebastian's attention. In the midst of strategizing, Mr. Lau entered, offering his assistance, which Seal reluctantly accepted. Seal warned of the consequences of failure, and as the guests arrived, Sebastian received them. Paul Jones, a journalist from Brit Business, engaged Sebastian in conversation. Sebastian escorted him to meet the genuine Tanaka, the director of the Funtum Company. Though against his intentions, Seal conceded to using Tanaka to answer questions. As Tanaka assumed a small form to answer queries, Sebastian managed the journalist. Upon departure, the journalist requested a photo with Sebastian, who declined, disappointing him. <sighs> Seal later inquired about the interview's outcome, with Sebastian praising Tanaka's performance. In the evening, Seal instructed Finney to throw a stone statue at him, intending to provoke a reaction. In an unexpected twist, Sebastian intervened, getting hit. Sebastian noted that he would have cooperated had Seal asked. As they attempted to clarify the photograph, Pluto, with his fiery breath, reduced the images to ashes. Later, Sebastian encountered Seal asleep in his chair, seizing the opportunity to photograph him alongside Pluto, who clung to a window in the background. A disapproving Seal confronted Sebastian, attributing the photograph to his own negligence in guarding himself. In a dramatic sequence, a man named Tim flees from his group, having stolen a valuable ring. He halts abruptly, examining the stolen ring. Suddenly, the eerie sound of strings fills the air as an unseen assailant strikes him down and casts his lifeless body into a river. Tim's comrades believe he jumped voluntarily. Meanwhile, the forest fair is in full swing in London, drawing the attention of Sebastian and Seal. Concurrently, Elizabeth, accompanied by her maid, discusses Seal's upcoming birthday and her gift plans. On a bridge, a conversation ensues regarding Tim's body found without the ring. 
The group surmises the ring might be submerged in the river. Seal's attention is drawn to a fake Funtum Company boat toy amidst the fair's attractions. Funtum arcs, exceedingly rare, were crafted by a talented artist patronized by Seal's predecessor. Notably, they possess cutting-edge technology. Seal recalls that after his mansion was raised, he no longer possesses one. During their fair visit, Seal spots a Scotland Yard officer who's not there for leisure but duty. The officer invites Seal to tea to discuss a matter. The officer reveals the discovery of a criminal organization member's corpse beneath the ice, with a missing blue diamond ring valued at 2,000 quid. Mr. Lau interjects with a reference to the ring's legend, wherein its allure drives individuals towards their own downfall. Suspicion arises when Lau seems knowledgeable about the Hope piece. The inspector questions Lau, who feigns ignorance. Seal dismisses Lau's cryptic statements and expresses his willingness to assist. The inspector leads them to the undertaker's funeral parlor, chosen due to the high number of fatalities during the forest fair. At the funeral parlor, the undertaker's laughter ignites jealousy in Sebastian, who aspires to be the world's comedic ruler. The undertaker's response to Seal's inquiry leads them outside to a sculptor holding the ring. Just as the inspector attempts to seize the ring, Viscount Drood intervenes. Seal is taken aback, his expression betraying unease. The Viscount proclaims that the ring shall be awarded to the contest victor. Seal vows to claim the ring, but the inspector shouts that the ring is stolen property, and evidence in a series of kidnappings. The truth dawns on Seal, the yard is frantically searching for it. He orders Sebastian to win the contest. A rival criminal group enters the competition, confident in their skills. They're determined not to lose to the English competitors, even prepared with explosives. The Forest Fair's sculpting contest commences, but Elizabeth remains melancholic over breaking Seal's ring. Gazing at a phantom arc, she witnesses a transformation as a stunning sculptor's piece emerges from within. Even Seal approves. Amidst the contest, a criminal with explosives interrupts, threatening everyone to leave. Seal stands firm, commanding Sebastian to retrieve the ring. Sebastian's swift actions disarm the situation, his impressive skating maneuvers and leaps captivating the judges. As the standoff intensifies, Sebastian's agility thwarts the criminals, causing chaos. Eventually, Sebastian and Seal stand atop the Noah's Ark sculpture, having quelled the threat. Tragically, the ring sinks to the depths of the Thames. Elizabeth's disappointment intensifies as she destroys the fake Phantom Ark she purchased. In a poignant moment, she uncovers the Hope piece. It becomes clear that the piece was planted by Tim's murderer, leading to a startling revelation about the crime's perpetrator. May Rin and Finney are taken aback as they witness Elizabeth's forceful arrival in her carriage. She rushes towards Seal, handing him a small gift and urging him to open it. However, upon glimpsing the ring in his hand, she swiftly reclaims the box, mentioning it was merely a ruse. According to Elizabeth, a true lady wouldn't attempt to win a gentleman's affection with material possessions, considering it disgraceful. After bidding her farewell, she vanishes, leaving Seal bewildered. Sebastian reminds him that his birthday is tomorrow, speculating that Elizabeth's visit might be connected to that. He suggests organizing a birthday party, prompting Seal to recall past memories of birthday celebrations, overshadowed by the haunting recollection of his parents' mansion being reduced to ashes. He dismisses the idea as nonsense and instructs Sebastian to bring him tea in his room. Meanwhile, Elizabeth's disappointment grows as she returns home. The ring in her possession begins to emit a radiant glow, capturing her attention. She notices a man playing a music box on the street, and his enchanting melody compels her to follow him. She eventually arrives at a toy store, where a perceptive man recognizes her sadness. He offers her a seat, prompting Elizabeth to pour out her heart, recounting her troubles. The man proposes numerous gift options within the store, and Elizabeth's gaze falls upon the dolls displayed around her. The man suggests the most fitting present for a precious person might be herself. Back at the mansion, Sebastian informs Seal that Elizabeth has disappeared on the streets of Islington. While en route to the location, Sebastian presents Seal with letters from the Queen concerning the kidnapping of young girls. As they travel, Seal directs Sebastian to compile a list of suspects and investigate the crime scene. Meanwhile, Seal struggles to control Pluto as they navigate the city. <laughs> Amid this commotion, Seal hears Grell's distinctive voice. Grell intervenes, revealing his demotion and his quest to collect troublesome souls for promotion. Pluto races past Grell, leading Seal to the toy store. Inside the store, Seal discovers a doll resembling Elizabeth. Grell appears, reciting from his to-die list, where he identifies himself as number 493, butler and puppeteer to the House of Mandalay. Pluto shatters the glass window and attacks the doll. Guided by Pluto, Seal locates an open door, entering a mansion with a jester theme. Grell follows, and Seal offers Sebastian's services in exchange for Grell's protection for the day. 
Grell ecstatically agrees. Inside the mansion, they encounter a victim turned into a statue that grabs Seal by the neck. Grell saves him, slashing the statue to reveal sand pouring from it. The puppeteer, with a candle in hand, emerges from another room, controlling dolls that converge upon them. Grell attacks but is thwarted by the dolls made of silk. Seal rushes towards the puppeteer, leaving Grell and Pluto behind. In another room, masks begin to talk and sing the same song, triggering Seal's memories of his past birthdays. Within this room, a man explains that nothing good ever occurs on Seal's birthday. He recounts the loss of Seal's mansion, parents, and now Lady Elizabeth. He claims Sebastian is to blame. Elizabeth reminisces about Seal's return to the estate, noticing how his smiles had vanished. Despite her affection for Seal, their relationship seems stuck in a cycle of uncertainty. They both detect the puppeteer's eerie sound, soon discovering a room filled with dolls. Sebastian deciphers that the puppeteer controls the dolls with his voice. He mimics the song's tune, immobilizing the dolls, and systematically disables them. The puppeteer emerges, asserting that Seal belongs to his master due to the ring on his finger. He reveals that the hope piece is a present sent to those destined to become dolls. Sebastian swiftly rescues Seal by leaping out of a window. Anguished by Elizabeth's fate, Seal berates Sebastian for not saving her. Sebastian explains that while an order is vital, a contract takes precedence, akin to his allegiance to the Queen. Despite searching every nook, they can't locate Elizabeth, except for a sealed tower. Only Pluto can unlock it. As they approach the door, Pluto's collar gleams, enabling him to open the entrance. The tower's peak houses a wooden door. Upon entering, they discover Elizabeth seated in a corner, controlled by strings. An axe flies towards her, but Sebastian halts its trajectory. Grell intervenes, severing the strings that manipulate Elizabeth. The threads lead to the puppeteer atop the tower. Suddenly, they're ensnared by invisible strings. Sebastian loosens the grip by kicking an axe towards the puppeteer, who crumples dead another puppet. Drossel Keynes' soul was collected five years ago. Another doll in the room stirs, heading towards a door. Inside, a man sits with his face turned away. They confront him about his transformation of girls into dolls. Seal tosses the ring at him, who reveals that Seal's fate was one of death since birth, claiming his existence is impure. He confesses to trying to erase him from the world. Seal confronts him, realizing it's just another doll. A tiny doll moves in its lap, escaping. Sebastian notices invisible strings, implying another puppeteer. They depart with Elizabeth. Elizabeth throws a small birthday party for Seal. Post-celebration, she returns home in her carriage. Seal and Sebastian speculate about the culprit. Seal recalls a marking on the tower floor that troubles him, but he keeps his uneasiness private. Later, as Seal retires for the night, Angela captures and crushes the tiny doll. Lifeless bodies hang upside down, suspended by ropes. Scotland Yard officers work diligently to detach the corpses from their morbid restraints, each body accompanied by a note. Inspector Aberline incurs the fury of Sir Arthur due to his inability to apprehend the criminal responsible. Arriving at the scene, Seal and Sebastian scrutinize the victims, all recent arrivals from India, confirming that none have officially died. A phrase on the notes, the child of craziness and laziness, intrigues them. A distinct symbol on the notes provokes Sir Arthur's anger, suggesting mockery of both Englishmen and the Queen. The suspect likely hails from India. As Seal and Sebastian venture into the East End, they're ambushed by hostile thugs who harbor disdain for the British. Before the confrontation escalates, an elegantly dressed Indian man intervenes, demanding the thugs back down. The thugs insultingly refer to Sebastian as Konsama, meaning butler. The man inquires if they are English noblemen, and when confirmed, he orders his companion, Agni, to attack. Agni's blows prove ineffective against Sebastian, whose resilience bewilders them. The leader questions if all Indians are savage enough to attack any wandering Englishman. This triggers his anger, realizing his comrade instigated the brawl without cause. In a surprising turn, he instructs Agni to support Seal instead. Agni defeats the thugs, and the man introduces himself as Prince Soma of Bengal, Aka Prince Soma Asman Kadar. They part ways after bidding farewell. Upon returning home, Seal and Sebastian find Mr. Lau visiting. Unexpectedly, Prince Soma and Agni appear at their door, explaining that they wish to see Seal and offer their gratitude for saving them. Agni introduces Prince Soma, revealing him to be the 26th child of the King of Bengal. Seal instructs Sebastian to keep them under observation. The following day, Seal wakes up to find Agni and Soma in his room. Soma playfully carries Seal, proposing they explore London. Sebastian hesitates, citing Seal's busy schedule. While observing Agni and Soma praying to Goddess Kali, they learn about her history. Later, Seal practices with Sebastian, and Soma persistently urges them to show him London. Seal's irritation culminates in a challenge. If Soma wins a duel, Seal will grant him the London tour. Agni inadvertently attacks Seal's vital point, prompting Seal to substitute Sebastian in the fight. 
The duel commences between the two butlers, culminating in a draw after breaking each other's swords. Shockingly, Seal realizes Soma can match Sebastian's skill. Soma explains that Agni is his palace's finest warrior, a rare opponent who matches him. Seal questions if Soma is another demon, but he clarifies he's an exceptional human. While Agni offers assistance in the kitchen, he recounts how Soma saved him from execution. Soma discloses they seek a woman named Mina, a former servant and his nursemaid, abducted to England. Soma's emotional connection to Mina compels him to reclaim her. Seal, however, dismisses the urgency, angering Soma who insists he can't comprehend his despair. Late at night, Seal agrees to entertain Soma until bedtime, engaging in a card game. Soma jokingly departs, claiming his busyness unlike Seal's leisure. Wow expresses suspicion regarding Soma and Agni. Seal can't discern their motivations, questioning how they could benefit from the crimes. As night falls, Sebastian observes Agni leaving the mansion. Sebastian immediately informs Seal about Agni leaving the mansion. As they prepare to leave their room, Soma unexpectedly appears, asking to accompany them. He had known about Agni's nightly excursions all along and is determined to uncover the truth. Arriving at Harold West Jeb's estate, a key figure in importing goods from India, they spot Agni entering the premises. Intrigued, they decide to investigate further. Peering inside, they witness Agni conversing with Mr. West. The conversation reveals that Agni has executed their plan flawlessly, eliminating rivals and securing West's power. Mr. West acknowledges Agni's exceptional skills and the fact that he no longer needs to hang more people. Their conversation shifts to Mina, prompting Soma to confront them about her. <laughs> Soma grabs Agni, demanding to know Mina's whereabouts. In response, Agni confirms Mr. West is his master. Agni attacks Soma under Mr. West's command but Sebastian intervenes, disguised as a deer. Sebastian saves Soma, claiming to be a deer there to retrieve the prince. Agni is commanded to attack Sebastian, and a fierce battle ensues. Sebastian, with deer-like agility, dodges Agni's attacks, tears of blood streaming from Agni's eyes. Sebastian ultimately escapes with Soma, leaving Agni behind. Back at their residence, Seal and the others discuss Agni's transformation upon hearing Mr. West's name. Soma explains that Agni's form is a manifestation of Samadhi, where he becomes untouchable through the power of faith born from love and belief in someone. Late at night, Sebastian enters Soma's room and exposes his reliance on Agni. Sebastian claims that Soma is a helpless child who can't do anything without Agni. Soma admits his dependence and perceived loss. Sebastian reminds Soma that he never truly possessed anything. The status, castle, and servants were inherited from his parents, and he never had his own belongings. Sebastian suggests Soma wasn't betrayed since he never had anything to begin with. Seal interrupts, ending the conversation. The next day, Seal and Sebastian, along with Soma, discuss Mr. West and the possibility of his involvement in the crimes. Lau explains that West might be pursuing a royal warrant. They explain that a royal warrant signifies official endorsement by the royal family, granting businesses the title of purveyor to the crown. A week later, a curry exhibition is set to take place at Crystal Palace, attended by Queen Victoria, a curry enthusiast. Seal predicts that West seeks to boost his coffeehouse's popularity by obtaining a royal warrant for his curry. To this end, he used Agni to eliminate competitors and create disturbances. Soma apologizes for his past behavior and offers to join them in investigating. During their preparations, they discuss West's connection to the curry exhibition. The festival commences with the participants showcasing their curry creations. Sebastian is told that Queen Victoria is in attendance. The event begins with fanfare and the rolling out of the red carpet. Amidst the bustling atmosphere of the competition, Queen Victoria arrives cloaked in black attire. The crowd erupts into a song of praise for the queen as she takes her place. The cooking competition begins in full swing, with both Sebastian and Agni displaying their culinary prowess. Each dish is meticulously presented to the judges, who find themselves greatly impressed by Agni's expert crafted curry. Sebastian's culinary creation, on the other hand, equally garners admiration from the panel of judges. Amidst the excitement, Agni crosses paths with Mina, who reveals that she had already informed Soma of the truth. As Queen Victoria samples Sebastian's curry buns, her enjoyment is palpable. However, a sudden shift occurs as Mina's behavior becomes erratic and violent. She starts attacking the Queen's guards and others who had consumed the curry created by the French cook, Angela's influence. The spices used in Angela's creation were forbidden and react adversely to the darkness within human hearts. Chaos ensues, and Mina's assault closes in on Seal. In the nick of time, Sebastian intervenes, saving Seal from harm. The forbidden spices' effects are potent, causing those affected by them to turn violent. Agni expresses remorse to Soma and vows to never leave his side again. 
Soma orders Agni to subdue Mina, and Agni joins Sebastian in the fight to restrain her. Sebastian employs a clever tactic, using his own curry buns to counteract the effects of the forbidden spices. The restorative properties of his buns neutralize the malevolent influence, and the affected individuals gradually regain their composure. As the situation stabilizes, the winner of the royal warrant is announced, and Funtum Company emerges victorious. The crisis averted, Mina is taken into custody by the Queen's royal guard. Queen Victoria herself commends Seal for obtaining the coveted royal warrant. After extending her congratulations, the Queen takes her leave. Soma, too, expresses gratitude for Seal's assistance and expresses his appreciation before departing for India with Agni. Ladlow Castle, in the midst of its transformation into a hotel, encounters an unexpected hurdle as the contracted contractors submit a petition, requesting a halt to the construction and the dissolution of the contract. Their reasoning, fear of ghosts that supposedly inhabit the castle. With a sense of urgency, they arrive at Ladlow Castle, hoping to swiftly conclude their tasks and return home. However, as they step inside, the door mysteriously shuts behind them, and the atmosphere is set aglow by flickering candlelight. An eerie voice questions their right to enter, and a young boy materializes before them, introducing himself as Edward V, the King of England from roughly 400 years past. Edward V shares that he and his younger brother Richard were confined in the Tower of London just before Edward's coronation. According to legend, their lives were tragically cut short by relatives with ambitions for the throne. This very castle served as their youthful residence. Seal respectfully kneels before Edward, introducing himself and expressing regret for any unintended disrespect. Seal attempts to negotiate their departure from the castle, proposing a chess game against Sebastian as a stake. In the ensuing chess match, Seal finds himself outwitted, resulting in a victory for Sebastian and their commitment to aiding Edward and his brother. Sebastian dutifully assumes his role as a servant, attending to their needs. Meanwhile, Seal delves into historical accounts, reading about the tragic fate of Edward and Richard. King Edward begins to recount his experience from the time of his murder. He awakens within the castle, devoid of memories from the day he was killed. Four centuries have passed, and both their killers and protectors have long departed from this world. In the company of his newfound companions, they share a heartfelt dinner. At night, Seal follows King Edward and witnesses him entering a concealed chamber within the castle's library. The door proves locked, but with Sebastian's deft touch, access is gained. Within this hidden space, they come upon a space that had once been a dungeon for the church's rejected criminals. Forgotten souls, lost even to the reapers, were cast aside here. King Edward reveals his bond with these lost spirits, symbolized by skulls arranged upon a chessboard. Notably absent is a piece representing Richard. Edward discloses that obtaining Richard's skull would grant him and his brother peace, compelling Sebastian to embark on a mission to retrieve the missing piece. Grasping Richard's skull, Sebastian's actions incite Edward's wrath. The king commands Sebastian to attack Seal, but the loyal butler refuses, citing his contractual obligations. Sebastian clarifies that his actions are guided by his duty to a true master, nothing more. Placing the missing skull onto the board, Seal and Edward are disheartened as nothing transpires. It is then revealed that the skull wasn't that of Edward or Richard, instead, it belonged to another. Richard shares the painful tale of their demise, their bodies brutally dismembered and tossed into the Thames, gradually consumed by aquatic life and mud until no trace remained. Touched by their shared sorrow, Seal encourages Edward to find solace and release the lingering pain. In an emotional embrace, the souls of Edward and Richard find peace and ascend to heaven, bidding farewell to their benefactors, Seal and Sebastian. The Grim Reaper arrives to guide their souls onward. With their task complete, Sebastian and Seal return to their own world, leaving behind a castle that has found its closure and the spirits that have been set free. Sebastian commences the day by detailing his schedule to Seal. A dance lesson with Mrs. Bright is on the morning agenda, followed by an afternoon meeting with Lord Wensler, known for his export-import business. However, Seal is far from enthusiastic about attending the dance class due to his weariness of it. Upon entering a particular room, they encounter the Queen's butler engaged in conversation with Tanaka. This sight puzzles Seal, leading him to question why the Queen's butler is present in his mansion. Sebastian discloses that Ash has been the one facilitating Her Majesty's orders. Seal inquires about the reason behind Ash's visit this time, and he learns of a curious situation. Outside of Preston, a Catholic abbey, long abandoned since the Reformation, has become a gathering place for a cult propagating deviant doctrines. Rumor has it that the cult leader possesses the Doomsday Book, a record of all followers' deeds and sins, as if a registry for the forthcoming Judgment Day. Ash clarifies that the Doomsday Book is not one of earthly possessions, but rather a register of actions, meant to be presented before the Lord on Doomsday. There's talk of a potential revolt against the government, which alarms Her Majesty. Seal probes whether they are being tasked with dispersing or eradicating the cult, and Ash leaves the decision up to them. 
However, the Abbey is heavily fortified, making infiltration challenging. Taking advantage of their chat, Seal asks Ash about the recent delivery of numerous coffins to the Abbey. This intriguing conversation prompts Seal to visit Undertaker's funeral parlor, seeking assistance. However, upon entering, he is met with the unexpected sight of Grell posing as Undertaker. An amusing exchange follows, revealing Undertaker's unconventional demise involving Salt, at which point Seal queries Grell's presence. Grell explains the recent theft of cinematic records, reels of film containing life memories. Grim Reapers extract these records from individuals individuals on their to-die list, replaying them to determine fate. Curiously, humans only witness these memories upon death. Sebastian inquires whether these records can be stolen, and Grell elucidates that they're stored in a library when not in use. These records encompass the complete past of all currently living beings, encapsulating their crimes and everything else in book form, similar to preparations for Doomsday. Seal beseeches Undertaker, who is now possessed by Grell, for a favor related to the Abbey. Undertaker obliges, transporting Seal in a coffin to the Abbey. As Undertaker distracts the guards, Sebastian, Grell, and seal stealthily enter. Unexpectedly, the guards themselves usher them in. Once inside the church, Seal notices a peculiar mark that resonates with one on his body. A child taunts Grell, leading to a brief altercation, and the children subsequently flee, chanting about being uncleaned. A woman dressed as a nun approaches, explaining the concept of impurity among those over a certain age. She deduces that Seal is a new convert, assuring him that studying their teachings will cleanse his body. Sebastian employs his charm, insinuating that such a beautiful woman couldn't possibly be impure. Sebastian accompanies the nun to engage in a seductive interaction. Afterward, she confides that the long-lived individual's doomsday books are considered impure. Their leader supposedly purifies the impure passage, revealing not just the past, but also the future, albeit only to the chosen children of the heavenly choir. Sebastian deduces that since only young boys are chosen for the choir, Seal could get close to their leader. The cleaning ceremony unfolds, and Seal is approached by the cult leader. Sebastian steps in to protect him, ultimately killing the leader upon Seal's command. However, their moment is disrupted by the appearance of Angela, soaring with wings outstretched. Angela seizes Seal, revealing a reel of cinematic records that she binds around Sebastian. A deathly confrontation ensues, with Sebastian urging Grell to retrieve his death scythe, unfortunately unavailable. <laughs> Having been taken by William. Angela informs Seal of her intention to expose the light and darkness of his past, vanishing into a portal, which Sebastian and Grell pursue. Seal finds himself in a space where his memories are laid bare, each recollection a tangible thread he can touch. One memory reveals his dying father and Angela with bloodied hands. In another setting, Grell and Sebastian enter the Grim Reaper's library of recorded memories. Upon encountering William, who taunts Sebastian's association with a demon, Grell defends their partnership. The tense interaction prompts William to notice an angelic presence. Returning to consciousness, Seal finds Angela beside him, questioning how he experienced his past. He inquires about the hand that touched him in the abbey, linking it to his father. Did she kill his parents, he asks, and questions the motive behind their deaths. Angela denies being responsible for their deaths and explains that she didn't anticipate him maintaining his sanity in the face of such a distorted past. Her wings envelop him as she explains the nature of his rewritten memories. Meanwhile, in the Grim Reaper's library, Sebastian, Grell, and William strategize against Angela. However, Undertaker appears, distracting them. Grell queries his presence, and William clarifies that he's a legendary Grim Reaper known for coaxing even the most stubborn souls to move on. Angela manages to escape their attention, placing an angelic seal on them to prevent escape. She reappears in the abbey, attempting to cleanse everyone by violence. Stymied by the seal, the group realizes there's one way to counteract it, the Death Bookmark, a tool reserved for the managerial class of the Grim Reapers Association. Undertaker employs the Death Bookmark to halt Matilda Simmons' narrative, sending Sebastian into the fray. There, he confronts Angela, joined by William, who pins the angel to the ceiling using his death scythe. Grell wields the same scythe to pierce Angela's hand. Sebastian employs knives to injure Angela further, but she begins self-destructing with a deafening scream, causing the entire church to tremble. Sebastian instructs everyone to flee as the church collapses. He too departs, and Angela's smile precedes the church's collapse. Believing the ordeal to be over, Seal implores Sebastian to take his soul, but Sebastian opts to serve him for a while longer. The following day at Undertaker's funeral parlor, Seal, Sebastian, and Grell question Undertaker about his presence at the library after retirement. 
Undertaker explains that he forgot to return certain cinematic records. He mentions two books regarding the Earl and Countess Phantom Hive, unadulterated cinematic records with no angelic alterations. Undertaker suggests Seal reads them to identify who to seek revenge against. Seal, however, declines, maintaining that it isn't his practice to repeatedly disgrace the dead. A young boy and an elderly man stumble upon a lifeless body in a river. The corpse, devoid of identification, appears to have been murdered elsewhere before being disposed of in the water. The Scotland Yard takes charge of identifying the victim. In the midst of this investigation, Seal arrives on the scene. He informs the officials that the deceased is John Stanley and presents certain documents to Sir Arthur. Additionally, Seal expresses his desire to inspect the victim's personal belongings for any potential clues. Inspector Aberline conveys that no significant items were found that could aid in identification. Subsequently, Seal and Sebastian leave the premises. Seal takes over the case that was handed to him by Ash. It concerns the discovery of a body at Regent Dock, identified as John Stanley. The victim was associated with a shipping company and was also involved in the underworld under a secret directive from Queen Victoria. While Her Majesty has provided orders for the disposal of a certain item related to Stanley, she has chosen not to disclose all the details to even Seal, her most trusted guardian. Seal is keen on uncovering the motive behind Stanley's murder. Sebastian suggests that they should search for witnesses who might have observed the crime. Together, Seal and Sebastian proceed to the residence of Mr. Lau. Mr. Lau holds the position of president in the English branch of the Chinese trading company Kunlun. He also happens to lead the Shanghai Mafia's Green Gang. The ongoing investigation by Scotland Yard has yielded no information about John Stanley. Lau informs Seal that a new drug named Lady Bran has been circulating in the city. However, Lau denies any knowledge or encounters with Stanley. Seal discloses his mission to Lau, revealing that he is on a quest to locate a particular item that Stanley was supposed to possess. Seal instructs Lau to spread a false rumor suggesting that he has acquired a valuable item from the deceased man found at the dock. This strategy is aimed at causing the person who murdered Stanley and took possession of his belongings to doubt the authenticity of the item they acquired, potentially prompting them to seek Seal. During their conversation, Mei Rin suddenly cries out, startled by something in her pocket. Upon examination, it is revealed that she possesses candies given to her during her time in the city. Finney also has some of these candies, which are packaged by Funtum Company. Tanaka, the real one, discloses that the packaging is authentic, but the content within is not genuine. Sebastian tastes the candies and concludes that they are morphine derived from opium. This aligns with the new merchandise that Lau mentioned. In light of this revelation, Seal urgently orders Sebastian to head to his candy company. However, their plans are abruptly halted as Aberline detains Seal on suspicion of violating the Medicines Act and collaborating with Lau, who is believed to be connected to the sale of the new drug. Averline reveals the discovery of a significant quantity of opium in Seal's warehouses. Moreover, most officers dispatched to apprehend Lau were either injured or killed. Sir Arthur, following a personal order from Queen Victoria, orders the separation of Sebastian from Seal and points a gun at the young Earl. A recent directive from the Queen has led to Sebastian's detention for further investigation. Sebastian finds himself imprisoned and subjected to brutal torture in order to extract a confession from him. Meanwhile, Averline questions Seal about his involvement in the drug case. Seal warns Aberline not to interfere, emphasizing that this matter is between him and those who are manipulating events. Aberline, following orders from his superiors, is obligated to follow the course of action he's been given, even if it seems unjust. A secret meeting is held among various individuals, including Senor Correro and members of the Pharaoh family. Lau is planning to relinquish his territory to the Pharaoh family, a move that the Pharaohs are eager to accept. The group discusses Stanley's murder and concludes that Lau was responsible for it. As Seal is about to leave his confinement, Inspector Aberline stops him. Seal asserts his authority, reminding Aberline not to underestimate the power of Phantom Hive. He claims that even though his pawns may have been taken from him, he will continue to play the game until the end, a fate that comes with being born into the cursed Phantom Hive lineage. Aberline extends an offer of assistance, expressing his willingness to be Seal's pawn. Aberline manages to locate a boy who witnessed the murder. The boy describes a Chinese girl and a white-skinned man who gave him a candy, the same morphine-laced candy found earlier. A drug addict attempts to steal the candy, but Aberline intervenes. Senor Carrero is abducted by Seal and Aberline. They interrogate him about the drug distribution, suspecting that Funtum candies are being used to spread drugs. Correro implicates Lau in Stanley's murder, revealing that Stanley had made advances towards Lau, leading to his death by Lau's pet tigress. Correro also suggests that Lau has obtained something valuable from Stanley. As Seal and Aberline attempt to flee from Senor's men, Seal unveils his hidden power by removing his eye patch and summoning Sebastian. 
the assailants are swiftly dealt with and Seal orders Sebastian to pursue Lau. With a cannon barrage from a distant castle, Seal damages Lau's ship. In the midst of the chaos, Seal and Sebastian board the ship. Lau's pet tigress attacks them, but Seal manages to reach Lau's compartment. Lau reveals diplomatic documents proposing a military alliance with Germany and Italy, orchestrated by Queen Victoria. These documents indicate that the Queen intends to spark a war by invading France using opium, similar to how England once invaded Lau's homeland with the drug. Lau confesses that he has grown weary of being a pawn and wanted to engage in a high-stakes game with Seal. Their confrontation intensifies as Lau attempts to attack Seal with a sword. Sebastian defeats Ranmao, Lau's pet, but when Lau targets Seal once more, Sebastian is impeded by Ranmao. Aberline intervenes, placing himself between Seal and Lau. Lau manages to pierce Aberline with his sword, but Sebastian intervenes and wounds Lau. Lau succumbs to his injuries and dies. Seal desperately attempts to save Aberline, but he passes away, expressing his contentment that Seal is safe. Aberline sees a reflection of himself in Seal and urges him to move forward before passing away. Seal is devastated by Aberline's sacrifice and slaps Sebastian blaming him for not protecting Aberline when he was in danger. A girl positions herself on a distant tower armed with a sniper rifle. Her vantage point allows her to clearly observe a group of men below, without needing to use a scope. She prepares to pull the trigger to eliminate her targets, but her focus is momentarily disrupted when she notices a child running towards the men. Despite her hesitation, she readies her finger on the trigger. However, just before she can take the shot, a figure suddenly appears behind her, Sebastian. He offers her a proposition, which she ultimately accepts. Sebastian then escorts her back to the Phantom Hive Mansion. This girl turns out to be none other than Mei Rin. Meanwhile, the maids and the maiden of the mansion notice that Seal's spirits are low, prompting them to hatch a plan to throw a party for him. As Finny works on the garden alongside Pluto, the loyal guard dog senses something amiss and starts howling. Seal notices a new newspaper article detailing an upcoming expo in Paris. Sebastian informs Seal that, as per Ash's information, Her Majesty will secretly be traveling to Paris to attend the event. After this, Sebastian departs and comes across Mei Rin who is outside polishing the railings. As he continues on to prepare lunch, an explosion rocks the mansion's kitchen. Sebastian finds Baldray emerging from the kitchen with his hair in an afro. Apparently, he had used dynamite as a cooking utensil to speed up the process. The kitchen is in shambles, and Baldray explains that he hasn't yet grown accustomed to a life of peace since joining the Phantom Hive household. Sebastian instructs him to clean up the mess before leaving. Meanwhile, Seal remains melancholic over Aberline's death. The maids are curious about the mansion's past appearance before their time there, but Tanaka is unable to provide any substantial information. They turn to Elizabeth for answers, who fondly recalls the Phantom Hive home as a place filled with smiles. The maids express their desire to bring those smiles back to the mansion. Elizabeth supports the idea and offers her assistance. However, as they discuss this, they hear a commotion and rush back inside the mansion. Pluto is barking at something, and Elizabeth questions the cause. The maids attempt to conceal whatever they were doing, but Sebastian intervenes and suggests Elizabeth rest before dinner. Back in Seal's office, he's constructing a card house when Elizabeth enters. She proposes that he teach her chess, and he agrees. Sebastian is summoned to bring a chessboard, and Seal begins to teach Elizabeth the game. As they engage in this activity, Sebastian contributes to the ambience by playing the violin in the background. Outside, the mansion comes under attack from enemies sent by Senor Correro. Baldo, Mayrin, and Finney take on the role of defenders. Baldo, a former soldier, was recruited by Sebastian during a tense battle. Finney, who had escaped from an experiment facility, was also enlisted by Sebastian. He exhibits incredible strength, even hurling wooden boulders from the roof. As Seal and Elizabeth engage in their chess lesson, Seal's thoughts drift to what Lau had revealed about the impending world war and the death of Aberline. Back outside, the trio of defenders, Baldo, Mei Rin, and Finney, successfully repel the attackers, proving themselves as dedicated members of the Phantom Hive household. Baldo expresses that Phantom Hive servants who can't contribute in such situations aren't worthy of their position. Maria, the widow of the late Aberline, receives numerous gifts for her soon-to-be-born child along with a letter bearing the royal seal. Upon reading the letter, she bursts into tears, clearly moved by its contents. Meanwhile, Seal is busy packing his belongings in preparation for his trip to Paris. During the cruise to Paris, Seal is lost in thought, prompting Sebastian to inquire about his distracted state. Seal confides in Sebastian about Lau's revelation concerning the Queen's role in instigating a world war. Upon their arrival in Paris, the iconic Eiffel Tower stands as the entrance to the exposition. The Machinery Hall, a magnificent structure of iron and glass, captivates their attention. Various exhibitions are taking place, each focusing on different topics. They overhear conversations about a stuffed angel exhibit and decide to investigate. 
However, to their surprise, the exhibit is revealed to be a mere monkey with wings. Just as Seal considers leaving, the monkey comes to life, shattering the glass enclosure and causing chaos. Sebastian advises Seal to depart while he handles the situation. As Seal exits the area, he finds himself in an unfamiliar and unsettling environment. He encounters angelic figures near a fountain and attempts to retrace his steps, but the path he came from is now blocked. Fleeing, he hides in an elevator within the Eiffel Tower. To his astonishment, he discovers the queen sitting at the far end of the elevator. She cryptically speaks about uncleanness within him and the necessity of cleansing the entire state. She claims that creation cannot occur without destruction and justifies her actions as a means to purify the nation. The queen leads Seal up the stairs, singing London Bridge is falling down along the way. Upon reaching the top of the tower, Seal questions her motives behind the gruesome murders she orchestrated. She explains that she sought to pay tribute to Phantom Hive's loyalty and aimed to cleanse the negative elements that had accumulated in her nation. As the wind sweeps away her mask, Seal witnesses the youthful appearance of the queen. Unexpectedly, Ash appears, revealing that he merged his existence with hers to prevent her from ending her own life after her husband's death. He implies that her actions were driven by a desire to bring the same joy to the Phantom Hive family. The Queen's intentions, guided by her deceased husband, are to lead England into a world of purity and light. She maintains that her transformation has purified her into a virtuous individual worthy of being a master for an angel like Ash. She commands Ash to attack Seal, but Sebastian intervenes, saving Seal. Seal commands Sebastian to eliminate Ash, and the ensuing battle between Ash and Sebastian is intense. The Queen pleads with Seal to stop the fight as the tower begins to crumble. Heeding Sebastian's advice, Seal orders him to retreat. Ash takes the queen and flies away, leaving the chaotic scene behind. After the dust settles, Seal explains his decision to Sebastian. He emphasizes that their fight could have attracted unwanted attention. Sebastian expresses shock at Seal's revelation that he doesn't feel any loyalty towards the queen, only acting as the head of the Phantom Hive family. As night falls, Sebastian prepares Seal for bed, acknowledging Seal's resilience in maintaining his facade. He encourages Seal to forget about everything and rest. In a dreamlike state, Seal encounters Aberline, who advises him to break free from being the Queen's puppet. The next morning, as Seal awakens, he realizes Sebastian is nowhere to be found. He contemplates whether their interactions the previous night marked a farewell. Seal leaves the hotel and seeks a ride to the port of Calais. However, a deceitful cart driver drops him off at the port of boulogne sur mer and abandons him. Without any money, Seal struggles to secure a place to stay. Meanwhile, the mansion of Phantom Hive is engulfed in flames, with Pluto under Ash's control, spreading destruction. The ferocious fire has raised the entire Phantom Hive mansion to the ground. Seal finds refuge aboard a ship, concealing himself from the crew. Unexpectedly, Undertaker appears, offering him dog biscuits and cryptic words. Seal rushes to the deck upon hearing screams, witnessing London engulfed in flames from a distance. Bewildered by Undertaker's presence, Seal inquires why he is there. Undertaker responds with a sense of history between them and issues a foreboding statement that he will die soon. Meanwhile, Grell roams the chaotic streets of London, reaping the souls of the departed. Ash informs the Queen that the salvation of the city through holy flames has commenced. The Queen's health has deteriorated upon her return from Paris. Ash attempts to heal her, but she rebuffs his efforts, preferring to let her body succumb. Ash's grin suggests a sinister intention as he labels her unclean. He takes to the sky, heading toward the burning city, asserting that despite her royal status, she remains human and no amount of mercy can change human nature. As the ship heads away from London, Seal approaches the captain, attempting to negotiate a return to the city. The captain refuses, prompting Seal to offer a valuable blue diamond ring in exchange for a rowboat. As he arrives onshore, Seal encounters a group of men who mistake him for French and attack him, attributing the fire to France. Amid the chaos and violence, he witnesses the city in turmoil. From the vantage point of a building, Ash observes Seal's movements. Marin intervenes, saving Seal from the assault. The other men in Ash's company include Sebastian, who refrains from joining forces with Ash despite his invitation. Ash unveils his unique form, mocking Sebastian by displaying his female attributes, a manifestation of Angela and Ash's merged identities. Seal commands Baldo to shoot Pluto with real bullets, while Baldo, Marin, and Finney attempt to subdue the frenzied demon hound. Seal, mounted on a horse, races toward the Queen's palace. Inside the palace, he discovers the Queen's lifeless body on her bed. Chaos unfolds as guards pursue him. As he is apprehended by the guards, Seal identifies himself as Seal Earl Phantom Hive. In the midst of confrontation, Seal sustains a gunshot wound to the pelvis, and his blood forms the distinctive mark in his eye. Just as the guards aim to execute Seal, Sebastian intervenes, eliminating all but one guard. 
he instructs Sebastian to escort Seal to the Angels of Massacre. Meanwhile, Ash absorbs the despair emanating from the deceased souls of London, an ominous power that hints at greater mysteries unfolding. Sebastian guides Seal through the wreckage-filled river on a boat. The riverbanks are littered with bodies, a grim reminder of the chaos that has consumed London. In this city known for its bridges, some of which are believed to have been crafted by demons, there stands a significant contrast in the form of the Holy Tower Bridge. This bridge was commissioned by Queen Victoria herself under Ash's directive. Seal and Sebastian ascend the tower, witnessing the souls embedded within its foundations. At the peak, they encounter Ash, who stands overlooking the burning city. Curious and outraged, Seal questions Ash about the Queen's death. Ash, however, contends that he merely cleansed her. Sebastian finds a spot for Seal to observe the unfolding confrontation and removes Seal's eye patch, discarding it. Seal issues a command for Sebastian to kill the angel. As their battle commences, they exchange powerful blows. Yes, my lord. However, Sebastian becomes ensnared in a black mist, leaving him incapacitated. Grell, fatigued from reaping souls, encounters Undertaker and learns about the nature of the black substance, composed of the emotions and experiences of the deceased. Undertaker ponders whether souls devoid of hearts can truly be considered souls and speculates if they can be stored in the Reaper's library. Ash's strength derives from the despair of unclean souls. His sword's glow foreshadows its deadly power. In a swift move, he severs Sebastian's right arm. William and Grell join forces with Undertaker, slicing through the black mist that has emerged from the dead. This action results in the souls dissipating from the tower bridge. The plan to call forth the demon hound using a whistle is thwarted as Phantom Hive's servants defeat the hound. In frustration, Ash unleashes a barrage of attacks while manipulating Angela's form. Sebastian intervenes to protect Seal, but Ash's final attack results in the loss of his arm. <laughs> Sebastian advises Seal to close his eyes and not open them until instructed. As Seal complies, Sebastian reveals his true demonic form, frightening Ash. As Seal listens to Angela's screams, Sebastian urges him to keep his eyes closed. The bridge trembles, and Sebastian counts to ten, culminating in the tower's violent destruction. Seal sees Sebastian's former appearance and loses his grip on the bridge, falling into the river. In a daring move, Sebastian plunges after him, rescuing him from the water. Soma and Agni offer help to the public amidst the devastation, providing curry buns. Meanwhile, a false queen stands amidst London's ashes, proclaiming the commencement of a new era. Seal reawakens to find himself on Sebastian's boat. As he opens his eyes, he observes Sebastian navigating his cinematic records, revealing that Sebastian is not yet dead. According to Sebastian, Baldo, Mayrin, and Finney are also alive, but Pluto has perished. Sebastian presents Seal with Tanaka's diary, intended to keep him occupied during their journey. The diary unveils a conversation between Seal's father and Tanaka, discussing the impending obliteration of the Phantom Hive earldom by Queen Victoria. Seal's father expresses no ill will toward her, urging Seal to remain loyal to the Phantom Hive name and to let go of hatred. This revelation resonates with the experiences shown by the angel. Their journey brings them to an island where ruins stand as a symbol of their journey's end. Sebastian guides Seal to these ruins, and Seal requests that Sebastian give whatever remains of him to the bird perched on the wall. Seal inquires if his passing will be painful. Sebastian promises to be gentle, but Seal insists on experiencing brutal pain as proof of his existence. As Seal leans forward, Sebastian removes his eye patch, signaling the beginning of the soul reaping process. That concludes the anime recap of Black Butler. Let me know your thoughts down below and I'm out. Watch.